morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 i'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 i'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. What a day that will be. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer.
wash my sin away, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What has part you save? What can wash my sin away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter faith will end in sight there's just a few more days to labor and then I'll take my heavenly flight
shall be eternal. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. Beulah land, Beulah land, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. If you can make it back, I want to speak to you this morning out of the book of uh, 2 Kings. What would, I'd entitle this, What Would God Like to See in Your House? Some might be familiar with this portion of Scripture. King Hezekiah was a good king, and he was king over Judah and Jerusalem. And yet, uh, at this particular point in time, he's going to die God told him to get his house in order. That's a sermon in itself, <laughs> getting your house in order. Hezekiah prayed to God and obviously asked him for more time. God granted him an additional 15 years in 2 Kings 26, and he says, God says, I will add thy days 15 years. But in verse 15 of chapter 20, uh, we, we find that The king of Babylon uh, sent his son, Baladan. Uh, He sent letters and a present to to Hezekiah because he had heard that Hezekiah was sick. And Hezekiah, the Bible says in verse 13, hearkened unto them, showed them all of the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices, took him all through the house. Um, his armor, treasures, there was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then God sent Isaiah the prophet to King Hezekiah in verse 14 and said unto him, What sayest these men, and from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, Well, they came from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All The things that are in mine house have they seen. Heavenly Father, help us to look at this and and take it to a a level that it pertains to us. God, what is it that you would be looking for in a house? What are the precious things in our house that would attract your attention? Uh, And Father, I pray that today we might learn from your word, we might be instructed, We might even be changed. I pray for the lost that would be here. They might give their lives to Christ. And all of us, Lord, that we might evaluate not only what we do have in our house, but, Father, what you would like to see in our house. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you remember, as I do, that poem of some years ago, probably 50 years ago, uh, that was written. If Jesus came to your house, there was some country people, uh, uh, Savine, I forget what his first name was, uh, uh, and some of the country singers actually even put it to music. But it was a great poem. It's, of course, dated today, but nevertheless, it still sends the same message. It's entitled, If Jesus Came to Your House. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he, crea- if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give him your nicest room in such, to such an honored guest, and all the food you'd serve to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're, you're glad to have him there, that serving him in your own home is joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, Would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched and welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in? 
or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they had been? Would you turn off the radio and hope he hadn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered that last loud hasty word? Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymn books out? Could you let Jesus walk right in or would you rush about? And I wonder, if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep up its usual pace? And would you find it hard each day? meal to say a table grace would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read and let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed would you take Jesus with you everywhere you'd plan to go or would you maybe change your plans for just a day or two would you be glad to have him meet your closest friends Or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus Christ in person came to spend some time with you. Powerful, powerful poem. And it makes us think, and any time God can make us think, it's always helpful and good. I just really want to build off of this one statement that Isaiah asked uh, uh, Hezekiah. And he says, uh, what have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah said, I showed them everything. Everything in the house, I showed him. It made me stop to think of what is God interested in seeing in our house. The poem even makes me think of what it, would God feel comfortable with in our house. If Jesus did come and spend a day or two, what would he be comfortable seeing in our house? Let me just mention quickly some things that I think God would be, be very pleased with if he came to your house and found them there. Number one, I think the first thing he's looking for, God looks for Jesus Christ in the home. He wants to see his son there. In other words, he wants to see you saved. He wants to see Christ living in you. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 5. You remember the story of little Zacchaeus, wee little man. He was a very wealthy publican. And he had heard stories about Jesus Christ, and he had heard that Jesus was coming to Jericho. And so the people were thronged the streets, and and he wanting to see Jesus uh, was so short that he couldn't see him. So he ran, and he found himself a sycamore tree, and he climbed up in it for the Lord he wanted to see, as the song says. And as Jesus was walking by in Luke chapter 19, verse 5, The Bible says that when Jesus came to the place, in other words, the sycamore tree, he looked up and saw him, Zacchaeus, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide in thy house. Interesting that he was interested in being in Zacchaeus' home. See, he wants to be a part of every aspect of our lives, God does. He wants to affect not only you for this particular moment when you got saved. He wants to be a part of your everyday activity. He wants to represent you throughout life and be a strong influence in your home. The first thing that God wants to see in a home is his son. And matter of fact, if we would have looked at that verse in Luke chapter 19, when it goes ahead and comes on down there and he says, I... uh, uh, for today I must abide in thy house. And when you get down to verse 9, and Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. 
for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so the first thing to please God is you, he wants you saved. And that's why we continually emphasize that point at Eastside Baptist Church. You're not going to go anywhere with God until you give your life to Jesus Christ. Accept him as your personal Savior. Again, you may be here. You've never given your life to Christ. We always encourage you to do that because over and over and over in Scripture, we see that God is, that's what it's all about. That's why Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you leave that out of the message, you've left out the primary gospel that Jesus came to fulfill. I've seen many mottos in people's homes, which reads, and you've read it too, Christ is the head of this home, the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. Well, that's a, that's a powerful motto. But for it to be true, the home needs to be a Christian home. And I hope that you have a Christian home. I hope every one of you have given your life to Christ. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm not saying I hope you've joined a church or that you were baptized at some point in your life or that your parents were Christians. I'm asking, have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you sure you're saved? Did Jesus come into your heart and life? I, I'd love to believe that everybody, 100%, could say with absolute assurance, yes, I've gotten Jesus in my life, I trusted him, I repented of my sins, and I've given Christ my life. For you see, no matter how much good you do in life without Christ in your heart, your labors are simply in vain. You go through the entire life with a fruitless life. As Solomon would say, it's a life of vanity. It, it, it was of no value. All that you do in life, if you miss heaven, you've missed everything. So, David said it this way, except for the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. It's wonderful when Christ is the center of your home. And we challenge every young couple that's getting married, make Christ the center of your home. And it'll, it'll change a lot about what goes on. Number two, God looks for love in the home. Or God looks for love in your house. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you may also love one another. The wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is he teaches you how to love properly. Most of the world does not even know how to love properly. It's so easy to love selfishly. In other words, I love you as long as I'm being satisfied. As long as you're doing things for me, I love you. I'm amazed at how many young couples today don't want to get married because they don't want to go through a divorce. Why in the world are you even thinking about it? You don't even think about it if you're in love. Uh, I just don't want to think about getting divorced down the road. Well, you shouldn't get married. If you're already planning it, it's, it's, it's tragic where we are in life. It's amazing. Hopefully you love each other. And if Christ is the center of your home, he teaches you to love properly. And that is that you love sacrificially. That's why the Bible says that Christ died for the church. So men ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We understand that emotions fluctuate. That's fleshly emotion. But Christ-centered love does it. It, it. You love. You love somebody because of who they are and because you love God. And matter of fact, you love your own honor, the fact that you have made a pledge. When Christ comes into your home, he teaches you to love properly. Most homes do not understand that at all. Well, you know what they did to me? Doesn't make any difference what they did to you. See, it's amazing what we do to God 
and he still loves us. He still loves us, regardless of what we do to God. There's nothing more attractive in a person's home, especially for the kids, than to see mom and dad love each other. It just gives security to a child to see that mom and dad loves each other. And it's, and it's obvious. And it's not just so much in the romance that they see, but they, it's in the honor and the respect that mom and dad show to one another. A kid feels so secure in such an environment. They just believe that, man, my parents are my rock. Love goes a long way. When you love somebody, it means you'll go out of your way to do things for that other person. You may not get anything out of it all. But that's not the point. The point is you're doing it for them because you love them. Jesus died on the cross not because he enjoyed doing it. He loved us. He suffered. He sacrificed strictly out of love for us. The sinner. It's amazing. If you love somebody in your home, you get joy out of helping the family. You listen to each other. They do things together. They forgive each other. And above all, they are able to overlook and forgive each other's mistakes. Well, I can't do that. The Bible tells me that love covers a multitude of sins. Let me say this. You ought to be thankful for mercy. We all need it. Aren't you glad that God says, I saw that mistake. I heard that comment. But I'm willing to forgive you in spite of it. Amen. Amen. Uh, it, uh, love is able to make that house and that home so much stronger if it's there. And yet, and, and love's sought after. People are trying to find it. But you'll never find it without Christ being the center of your home, nor you, will you find it unless you allow Christ to flow through you and live his life through you. Number three, God looks for the Bible in the home. Psalm 119, 140, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Isaiah, the prophet said, Hezekiah, what have they seen in thine house? I'd love to think that God would see us with the Bible, loving the word of God, reading the word of God, meditating upon the word of God, and obeying the word of God in our home. King David writes these words in Psalm 119, 140, and he says that he loved the Word of God, and so should everyone who loves God love his Word. And I hope that you love the Word of God today. There's a lot of people who don't. They claim to be Christians, but they could care less about ever hearing a sermon or reading the Bible. They just don't want to even be bothered with what God has to say. How can you love somebody and never want to hear from them? That's why I still carry my Bible. I will always carry my Bible. I thank God for the conveniences that we have. It's on your phone, it's on your tablet, it's on your computer, and I thank the Lord for that because no matter where I am, I can always pull it up. Amen? But there's still something about when I walked out of my house with a blessed book by my side on a Sunday morning, People know where I'm going. I go to the hospital, carry that little New Testament down the hallway. They know there's something spiritual going to be going on. I'm saying to you, I like even the identification of the Word of God to those around me. We should read from it at your house. Let your kids see you reading it. 
It can often be the source of our conversation at the house. Marsh and I often talk about verses of Scripture. Hey, what's this mean? And what do you get out of this passage of Scripture? And it makes a, a tremendous means of conversation. What a wonderful conversation to talk about Scripture verses and things. And you say, well, you know, that is kind of tough. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Makes for an interesting topic of conversation rather than politics all the time. Children should be encouraged to memorize verses out of the Bible. That's why we have the Awana program. We try to hide the word of God in their heart that they might not sin against God. And the more they read the Bible, the more the Bible will touch their lives. Families should be able to submit to its teachings, regardless of the difficulty. And that's the amazing thing. It will touch your life. And it will, uh, you'll say, oh, wow, I don't know that I'm doing that. And that's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's instruct us. It's to reprove us. It's to rebuke us. It's what it's for. We don't change it. It changes us. Thank God for the Bible. I hope, I hope it's an active source in your home. I mean, put it down on your priority list and say, some point in this week I'm going to read something out of it. And then once you've done it and you say, hey, that was enjoyable, say, I think maybe I'll try to work another little session in this week. And the more you do it, the more you'll find it enjoyable. But you do have to force yourself many times, no question about it. To love the Bible is to love God. Why else would you read the Bible if you don't want to hear from God? By this shall all men know that you are my disciple if you love one another. So we're to love Jesus Christ. Invite him into your life. Get saved. And then allow him to show you what love is in your house and in your home. Stay in the Word of God. Fourthly, God looks for prayer in the house. Prayer is a wonderful, wonderful privilege that we have. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Prayer is a privilege that God allows us his children to have. Under stressful situations, we can pray to God in Jesus' name, knowing that he hears our prayers. As times get worse in America, there'll be more and more praying going on. When they have this great reset convention down in, in Washington, D.C., at the end of September, the conservatives showing up in masses, hundreds of thousands of people will be there. They're going to call for a time of prayer for our nation. They couldn't call for anything more important than prayer. It doesn't say we're going to go out now and get back at all these thugs. We're going to burn down their city. No, 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 no. We call on God and ask God's intervention, ask for God's help and his wisdom and his protection. Prayer, in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And I can give thanks when I pray because I know if I pray in Jesus' name, God hears my prayer. Even when you don't know what to do, God says pray. And there will be some times, and you'll be in stressful situations, a loss will be so great for you. It can be a, a loss of a family member. It can be a spouse. It can even be a financial loss or a loss of your health. But there are some losses that are so devastating you don't know what to do about it. God says, pray. Talk to me about it. Talk to God. The, the very God that made you knows you and can bring comfort to you. Sometimes our prayer is simply to change ourselves. 
And if we're bold enough and honest enough to look to God and say, God, reveal to me my weaknesses. Show me my shortcomings. And then, God, let me look at them. And then, God, give me the power to overcome those things. I want to be a better person. If we've got the courage to do that, God, I want to see myself as you see me. And Lord, I think there's some things that you would be pleased in my house. Even in this house here. Internal things that you wouldn't want to see. You're not pleased with them. And if you had any right and any authority over it, you would get rid of them. God, I'm asking you even now, help me to get rid of those and replace them with things, Father, that you would be pleased to see. Can we be that bold? I hope that we can. Because I guarantee you, God would be pleased with that prayer. <clears throat> He's, it's, it's his business to change us and to make us more into Christ every day if we allow him. And nothing is more beautiful than a person who has a Christ-like character. You know, we spend so much time on the outward appearance, don't we? Do I look manly? Do I look big? Do I look strong? How beautiful do I look? And everything about us. If we would spend half the time on the inward person, God, how, how's my character? What's the fruit of the Spirit look like when people see me? Do they see my patience? Do they see my kindness? Do they see my goodness? Do they see my self-control? God, if not, help me. Help me in those. God loves those kind of prayers. And he wants to help change us all the time. And so I guarantee you, if God has anything about your house and your home and he's walking through and you would allow him to see that, he'd say, let me help you in that area. Can I clean the little closet over here for you? Can I uh, take that corner over there and just dust that a little bit for you? He'd help us if we just let him. I hope that every, every home prays over their meals, acknowledging that that is a blessing from God. I hope that the older you get, matter of fact, the more you'll do this every day, you'll be thanking God just for your health. Thank you, God, for another day of good health because you start appreciating your health more and more. Our children should be taught to pray early in life. <clears throat> and, I, uh, and do teach them to pray. Nothing wrong with starting them out at the bed, you know, now lay me down to sleep, <clears throat> and so on. And as they come along and they're comfortable, then start teaching them what else to say. Just say, now, honey, what do you want from God? And they'll tell you. Say, now, I want you to pray and ask God. You might even give some suggestions <coughs> on, excuse me, on um, what God would like for them. What's he looking for in their life? Tell, help them to pray so that they're comfortable as they grow older. They ought to be taught that God is powerful enough to answer their prayer, and he is. They have their own fears. They're scared many times over things, that, whether it's at school or bullies or whatever. They have their share of fears, and they ought to be able to bring them to their parent as well as to God. Number five, God's looking for discipline in our houses. Proverbs 3.12. For whom the Lord loveth, he cracketh, even as a father, I'm sorry, yeah, Proverbs 3.12, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Discipline is never enjoyable for the moment, and as a result, a lot of people overlook it. My parents never overlooked it. <laughs> they somehow learned that that's important in life. And so they learned the principle of discipline and never hesitated to exercise it, at least in my and my brother's life, which was, which was good. 
And it's interesting, even as our, we grew up, my, my kids look back, and now what they thought was terrible of me years ago, now they use it as illustrations and laugh about it. Boy, my dad, that was me. <coughs> Boy, he did this, 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 this. Now, they wouldn't have done that years ago. They would have said I was nasty and terrible. Now they look back on it and they say, hey, it's what I needed. And I can kind of laugh about it now. Discipline is never an enjoyable thing. Parents often think their children will hate them for life if they discipline them. I was reading about a little girl who was being punished. Uh, so she was told <clears throat> to eat, uh, take her meal and eat it in the corner. You can't eat with us because of the way you carried on at the table. So she took her meal over and sat at the little card table over in the corner. And the family really paid no attention to her until they heard her pray. And she raised her voice so her parents could hear her pray. Thank thee, I thank thee, O Lord, for preparing a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. <laughs> Kids are sharp. But they need discipline. They need this. Look at what you see out here on the streets today. It's just rebellion. So much of that could have been handled when they were three, four, five years old. <clears throat> but the state stops, jumps in and says, no, 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 don't do that. Now you reap what you sow. Now you've got total rebellion, and they're not going to accept any authority from anybody. I don't care whether it's the mayor, the, uh, the police, or the president of the United They don't care who it is. We're just rebellious. Why? Because we've never been taught discipline in our lives. We think we should have our way whenever we want our way. I'm sorry, but in a civilized society, you can't behave like that. There has to be discipline. There has to be laws. There has to be order. The Bible tells us that when you discipline, you can actually discipline in love, doesn't it? Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. That's why he corrects us, because he loves us. And that's why parents, if they love their children, will correct their children. It's an act of love, because you're trying to put them in the right direction in life. It shows your children that you care enough to take some risks in helping them make right and godly decisions. And it's every bit of a, uh, it's every bit as much a dad's responsibility as it is mom's. Even though mom gets stuck with it most of the time, dad, it's you need to shoulder that responsibility as well. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, the Bible says. But he that loveth his son chasteneth him be times or, or early. And I'm sure God, when he walks through the home, and uh, examines your house, he wants to see, do we love our children enough to provide correction and discipline for them? Number six, God looks for peace in our house. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace in the home. Tom speaks about things about peace in the valley, and one of these days there would be peace in the world when Jesus sets up his kingdom. Why? Because it is a godly quality. Peace is a godly quality. And therefore, he would want it in a godly home. There should be peace in your home. And yet, in the day in which we live, there's, there's as much fighting that goes on in Christian homes as there are in lost people's homes. That's tragic. God's supposed to make a difference in our lives. Well, you say, I don't know. Well, you don't, you don't live with him. You don't live with her. A minister was finishing up a series on, on marriage. At the end of the service, he was giving out a small wooden cross to each married couple. 
He said, place this cross in the room in which you fight the most and you'll be reminded of God's commands and you won't argue as much. One woman came up after the service and said, could I have five of those? <laughs> and it, it goes on like that. I think she needs more than a wooden cross. She needs something on the inside. There's quarrels in the home because everyone has an opinion on how things should be done. There's no question about that. <clears throat> we all have an opinion on how things should be done and decisions that should be made. But God gives us a solution to dealing with differences and quarrels. A good portion of scripture on that is Colossians chapter 3. You ought to mark that in your Bible. Matter of fact, let's look there for just a second. Colossians chapter 3. Because of the fact that we all are different, and we all have different solutions. And so the question is, is who, who's going to have the authority? Who's going to, have, who's going to be able to do this? Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, put on therefore as the elect of God, he's talking to Christians, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. He's saying, he's saying that uh, if both parties actually possess those qualities, it wouldn't be hard to come to a solution because the other one would always be wanting the other person act upon their solution. If everybody was humble, uh, we were long-suffering, kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. Uh, it would change our homes, but we're not. Matter of fact, when we have differences, we get, we get, we get, we get tight, we get tense. I'm going to defend my territory. I have every bit of right as you have. And all of a sudden, it's all about us. And the fight begins. It's because we lack a lot of those qualities. And God says, I want to change you. Matter of fact, those, matter of fact fighting will continue, continue on until God changes us. We cause the problems. And yet he takes two people and meshes them together with total different backgrounds and opinions and thinking and everything, and he expects us to get along. How's that possible? He changes us from the inside. You see, once we think more of our spouse than we do ourselves, peace will come. 1 Thessalonians 5.13, And be at peace among yourselves. See that none render evil for evil unto any man but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. You see, we can't totally have peace with everybody, but we can have far more peace if we work at it, and it becomes a priority in our dealings with other people. But sometimes we just don't want a peace. We, we want to fight, <clears throat> and thus we get a fight. If God walks through a house... He walks through your home, and he sees you quarreling. He would not be pleased with that. And we can all say, God, let me tell you my reason, and you can tell me your reason, but the fact is, Jesus says, I want peace. I am the source of peace. My peace I leave with you, not as the world. I give you a different source of peace because you've got a different source of love. Lastly, God looks for a godly example in your house. 1 Peter 2.21 1 
For even hereunto ye were called. God says, I'm going to tell you something now. You were called to this. Because Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. He said, Jesus is our example. And rightly so, because when Christ comes into your life, he's living his life out through you. He so desperately wants to live his life so that the world can see Jesus living in you and me. A Christian example in our homes and our houses is the strongest message we can leave our family and the community. A Christian example really is what our country needs right now. When you look at those cities burning, you know, somebody walks up to a little girl sitting in a car and just shoots her right in the head the other day. There's nothing absolutely, it was satanic, isn't it? It's just satanic. It's the opposite of anything godly or wholesome. <clears throat> what a world this would be if people behaved like Christians. If all the people in 65% or above claim to be Christians in America, some say 80%. Can you imagine if 80% of the people who claim to be Christians literally lived like a Christian? It would change this country. It really would if we lived like it. But they don't. What does God see in your house? He sees us. And he sees the way we live and the way we behave and whether or not we're living a Christ-like example or we're not. A Christian example gives you the power to overcome the devil. When you walk in the spirit of the Lord, you're able to overcome the flesh, which is Satan's living, and how he wants you to live. When you're a Christian example, you'll bring joy to your family. When you're a Christian example, it shows others how to live to please God. A Christian example also gives clear instructions to our children. And a godly example also brings God's blessing upon us. Does God see that in your home today? Does he see Christ in your home? Does he see a love in your home or selfishness in your home? Does he see an open Bible that one's being read and looked at and studied? What about prayer? Does he ever see prayer in your home? And if so, how much prayer does he see? Does he see discipline as far as your children are concerned? Above all, does he find peace in your house and home as well? And then does he find a godly example in your home? Do people look at you and say, hey, if you want to see if somebody lives like Christ, I want you to point to that so person right over there or that person right there. There's a godly example. Would people say that about you? Would they say that about me? The question is, is what would God see in my house today? And he does see it. He sees it every day. We can't hide a thing from God. But if you came to spend a day with us, would I change anything? Would I quarrel less with my family? Would I read more of the Bible if he was there? Would there be greater peace in the home? If so, allow God to change that in us even today. Stand with me, please. I'll stay in the